By the grace of Christ, my brethren, let us continue our lesson from the book of Revelation. We are in chapter 3 and verse 14. Book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse seven, 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eye with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. The Lord is speaking to the last church, the seventh church the seventh of the seven, the last of the seven of Asia, of Asia Minor, where our Lord Jesus Christ showed and revealed to his servant John, who was a witness of Christ, a witness of the Word of God, in affliction and exile of Patmos. But not only do all things work for the better for those who love God, according to God's intention, but also God works. And the difficult situations that He permits, He works marvelously. And so I can say it more correctly. When God brings difficult situations into our life, this means that He's preparing something. It is preparing something good, something great, so long as this has not, has not come from our own mistakes. And secondly, that we do not become indignant, that we do not complain to God, but with faith we wait for the interventions and in God's activities. <clears throat> so in this seventh church, which must be, I dare say, especially blessed, at least according to men. It is a great church. It is a wealthy church. It is independent. It needs no assistance from anyone. And the pastor of that church, whom Christ appoints, because Christ sets up the ministries in his church, so he can put him there, it means that until that point he was very happy that he was doing what was pleasing before God was happy with him but now as our Lord speaks to him he sees something that only Christ can see nor the church nor he himself can see it only Christ can see this thing and reveal it because things continue to go well in his life things continue to be pleasing supposedly pleasing to God because all things are going well with him. And God comes to reveal that nothing is going well. And nothing is going well means it's, it's not. And nothing is going well. The cause, of course, is not God. It's not even the church. But it is the pastor himself. It is this man himself. It is that person whom God being pleased, he blessed him, and now he sees a change of course. 
For that reason, the letter that he sends, the word that he sends to the angel of the church and to the church, is not only a revelation that only God knows, but also a special rebuke that only God can give. I repeat, nor has he understood a thing, nor has the church realized, nor any other person realized what's wrong with him, or what can understand what's going on. Because only God knows the hearts, and especially the heart of this specific man who happens to be the pastor of that church. For that reason, my dear brethren, in our life, the Apostle Paul says, My conscience convicts me of nothing, but I am not satisfied with this because God questions me. So in our life, there will be difficult days, there will also be blessed days. The crucial point is not for us to examine if there are difficult, blessed Good, easy. This is the grace of God in our life for whatever may happen. What matters is for us to examine our heart. And our heart, only God knows it. Only God can reveal it to us, can show us. <coughs> and only God, with interventions of His own, can He correct it because... The way of correction, we do not know. It is very ugly for us to quiet down in the fact that we are very satisfied with ourselves. It's very bad. It is dangerous. Extremely dangerous. If we look at ourselves and say, glory be to God, I'm going well. And even more dangerous for other people to look at our life and, us, and we to discern from the other people that we're going well. To have a good testimony in other words. This is not the crucial point here. This is not where the danger is. That is where glorification of God is. The danger is for us to discern the depths, discern the depths of our heart. For our heart to not deceive us which is deceiving of all things and desperately wicked. And it can very easily trick any one of us. So the Lord comes now in an absolute manner. And He says, I am Amen. I am the truth. But at the same time, I am what you need. I am the faithful and true witness. I am the one who can bear witness to you the depths of your soul, the depths of your heart, and bear witness and reveal to you and show you in absolute faithfulness and absolute truth, not only the present, but also the future. It is I. And not only that, but I am the one who determines your future in the end. Because I am the beginning of all creation. Christ says, to me, all authority has been given in heaven and on earth. I am the one who has absolute authority. So as he reveals, as our Lord Jesus Christ reveals himself to this church in this way, this man, today, the Lord reveals himself to every one of us separately. God has the ability to do this through His Word, to reveal to every one of us, not the heart of another person, God forbid this, but our own heart. Not the heart of my wife, or your husband, or your brother, or your child, your mother, your father, but your heart. Because your future does not depend on the heart of any other person, on the behavior of any other person, on the sanctification of any other person, or on the uncleanness of any other person. Your future depends on your own heart. And your heart, Christ knows it 
better than you and I. Because even though it is written that the spirit of man knows the insides of man, the inner part of man, and it's the truth, just like the spirit of God knows the depths of God, there is something else that is written as well. Our heart is deceiving and it can trick us. But there is even something else that is written. With all diligence, keep your heart, my son, for out of your heart, only from your heart depend all the outcomes of your life. So as he reveals to this man the things that he has not understood, our Lord says, I know your works, and I know something that you haven't realized yet, that you're neither cold nor you warm. You may think that you are hot. You may think that you may have any type of opinion concerning yourself, as we will see later on, but I'm telling you that you're neither hot nor cold, and you are lukewarm. For that reason, I am going to vomit you out. You are lukewarm. And here, my beloved brethren, let us know, and I repeat, everyone for himself, the situation of our heart, of our own heart. Why? Because it's written that in the Gospel according to Matthew, our Lord Jesus Christ said, Enter through the narrow gate, for broad is the gate and easy the way that brings to perdition, and many are those who enter through it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult the path that brings into life, and few are those who find it. There are two doors through which we approach God, which we live in, where, where we walk in, into different paths. One door is the one that many find, which is broad. You can easily go into it. And the way is easy, where in this course you can do whatever you like. You can do whatever you want. Whatever you can imagine, you can do it. And you can be a Christian. And you can be born again. And you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit even. And you may have a good past as well. And you may have the favor of God. It is very easy for you to change that door. What does our Lord say? Strive to enter through the narrow gate. It is a continuous struggle. <laughs> In this broad and easy way, you can without rebuke because your heart um, convey, um, mocks you you can walk without fear of God because your conscience has has been skewed a bit and you may not feel any conviction or intervention by God in your life and this whole thing begins slowly, slowly, very slowly does man change his course. As this person here, and he hasn't understood a thing. His course changes slowly, slowly. Firstly, first of all, the transformation, the outward transformation of the body of man begins. That is where everything starts from. The transformation begins slowly, slowly. Either be a man or a woman. He begins to change the image of man as man must be the image of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. So, the outward appearance of man begins to change which is the easiest thing to do. But it doesn't stop there. Afterward, the inner man begins to be transformed based on the desires in his heart. And what does lukewarm mean? Lukewarm means that he's not ablaze. 
He is no longer zealous. He is no longer faithful. He doesn't have the fear of God. He doesn't have the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And he begins, though he wanted, for example, he, he loved the Word of God, prayer, seeking God, fellowship with one another. In other words, he wanted the doctrine of the apostles, the breaking of bread, fellowship with one another in prayers. Now, I'm not saying that he stops wanting these things, but he adds something else. He adds a few other things that he wants to the things that God had laid in his heart for so long. He begins to say, it doesn't matter, brother. So what? And... Then the obedience to the word of God, he considers it strictness, which he did not consider it earlier. The rightly dividing of the word of God, he considers it dogmatism, which he did not consider it to be before. Rightly dividing, rightly walking on the word of God, he considers it fanaticism, which he did not consider it before. And slowly, slowly, the transformation of his soul begins, of his will. So first the transformation, the outward uh, transformation begins that says, I like, I like it, brother. I say to myself. Let me wear that. And let me make, the, the, do this haircut. Let me do that and the other. I like it. I want to be a bit different. Then the transformation of the soul. I want. I want to go there. I want to do this. Why shouldn't I have com uh, keep company with people of the world? They're good kids. They're my friends. My girlfriends. We begin to want. The transformation of the heart begins. Entering the lukewarm. And then... Finally, the transformation of the spirit begins, which is the decision making. Because with our mind, with our spirit, man makes decisions. He begins to choose. Not the honorable in rejecting the vile, but he puts some water in his wine. Not absolutely honorable. I don't choose the absolutely honorable. Nor is there something that is absolutely worthless. So, he begins to enter this thing that is called making, making a compromise. I compromise with the world in regard to what I like, the things that I like. Is it bad for me to go and uh, watch? I'm not saying this so I can convict you or any one of us to rebuke. Should I go watch the DVD or go to the theater or go to the cinema or go to that beach over there where there's a lot of people? Is it bad for me to wear a bikini as a girl? I'm talking about women now. Is it bad for me to go with my, with my fellow peers and, uh, and pupils? I like it. I want it. And the decision is made. Of course I'll do it. Let's not be so harsh, so cruel, so fanatic. Come on. The issue, my dear brethren, is not if we are strict or less or more strict. The, the issue is not there. The issue is for us to be pleasing to God. That is the requirement. And that is the crucial point and that is the revelation, where the revelation of God is. That is where the instructions of the Holy Spirit are. So when he begins to transform and he changes, and you can see, if my wife changes, I'll understand it. If my daughter changes, I'll see her. If my son changes, I'll see it. If a sister or brother changes, I'll see it. You can see this. You can tell. But the crucial point is not what I see or what you see in somebody else. It's what I see in myself that, you can, that I cannot see. Then pride comes in. Self-mindedness. 
And here come false doctrines. As the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, if somebody has false doctrines and he doesn't follow the healthy words of the Lord, which is godliness, a uh, doctrine, the teaching of Christ according to godliness, then depart from these. Why? They will defile many. They do not file the, follow the doctrine of godliness. And what does Paul says to Titus? Say to Titus. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith, not of the children of God, but of the elect of God, because many are called, but few are chosen. which is the acknowledgement of the truth which accords to godliness. So there is the teaching that is according to godliness, and there is the truth which accords with godliness. And what does godliness mean? A good way of respecting God, which is the sound doctrine, the gospel of Christ. So the matter is not whether I like myself, I stand before you and I say I'm so good, or if I'm pleasing to you, if you like me, or if I like you. The matter is if we, lie, we are pleasing to the Lord. For that reason we strive to do what is pleasing before God, knowing that at some point we'll find ourselves before the judgment seat of Christ, so that every one of us may be rewarded according to what he did in the flesh. But, when we started out we said that this revelation that God gives to the heart of this man, to the church, and to us today. Beyond everything else, it determines the future, the future of our life. Now he's in the presence of God. He feels very nice about himself, about God. He feels very nice in church. He feels strong. He needs nobody. I dare add, as a fool, he prays and God listens to him. God speaks to him. But, this revelation determines the future. The future of this man. The future of every one of us. Because you are neither cold nor warm, warm any longer, but now you have become lukewarm. I prophesy to you, says Christ, that I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Very harsh words. I will take you out. What does I will vomit you out mean? I will take you out of my body. I will take you out. Now you are in my body, but I'll take you out of my body. And if Christ takes somebody out of his body, which is his church, which is his presence, which is his grace and the glory of God, this, then this man is not only that he was found out of the presence of God, even by the, of the grace of God and the mercy of God, but the worst thing of God is all is that he found himself in darkness and in the ruler of darkness. The church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. If Christ takes you out, <coughs> then you are in the lie and in deception. The church is the body of Christ and God is light. If he, Christ takes you out, you are in the absolute darkness. There where you can't see anything anymore. If Christ takes you out of the church, then you are taken out of the love of God the Father, the grace of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit, and you find yourself in the ruler of this world, and the God of this world. And their things are not easy. And who? This blessed man of God. And who? 
the one who had very good fruit. And who? This one for whom concerning whom God acted wondrously with great fruition besides God gives the fruit. I am going to vomit you out, he said. Because you did not observe You did not observe your course that it, it, it departed from the narrow path, from the difficult path, and it shifted into the broad gate, and now you're walking in the easy way, where many can find that way. Now you do whatever you want, whatever you like, and whatever you decide to do. I repeat this. Now you do whatever you like, whatever you want, and whatever you decide to do. While beforehand, you did whatever God likes, whatever God wanted, and whatever God decided for you. You asked God. You did what was good, what was straight before the Lord. As... You searched out as you studied the Word of God and continued in it, and that's why your progress was apparent before all men. It was known to all men, and it still is. But the future is uncertain, or rather, it is certain. First, you did... By doing what was right before the Lord and pleasing before Him because you sought the Lord. You did not continue on your own. You did not go forward on your own. Your life, you, began, you started your day and you finished your day offering it to God. All your petitions, you assigned them to Him. And that's why God worked in your life and He gave you the requests of your heart. Your hope was in Him alone. Now your hope has been taken to, on to your own abilities. As you say, I am wealthy. I am rich. I am in need of nobody. And I now walk the way that I like, the way that I want. And I do whatever I decide to do. I am free. Really, this isn't liberty. As people think. This is the beginning of great slavery in this world and in the ruler of this world. Because free is not he who does whatever he wants, who does whatever he likes, he does whatever he decides. Free is the man who does whatever God wants. Because only whomever God, Christ, sets free is free indeed. He set me free from smoking. I no longer smoke. But if I decide to smoke again, then I myself have enslaved myself to my own sin. And now I cannot set myself free. Now the bondage is even harder. Now my life will be truly not in trials, not in sorrows, what Christ says, but in afflictions of the soul, body, and spirit. Now I will understand what slavery is. Because only Christ can set free from sin, and He is waiting for man to enslave himself to Him, becoming a witness of His. By living for Christ, in Christ, walking, all in a manner of always entering through the narrow gate and always walking in the difficult path. He does not step backward, nor does he make a few steps to the side. He walks straight on, doing what is right, upright before God, and being led as he always seeks 
by the Holy Spirit. He's led by the Holy Spirit. A person that from him, no, no, out of the, the fact that he has depended his whole life on Jesus Christ, an absolute, and on the power of the Holy Spirit, he cannot say that I am wealthy. But he says, I am poor and miserable. Because the things that he has are not his. The things that he has, the only thing that is, use, that is valuable is Christ and he's afraid he might lose it. So how easily can your heart deceive you? Remember the younger son. He was in the absolute blessing of God. An absolute blessing. The father, son of the father, he had possessions, he had work, he was an absolute blessing. What was this thing that happened in his heart? And his heart began slowly, slowly. His heart slowly, slowly began to slip away. And it left. He began to think. He began to imagine. He began to like it. He began to desire. And he drew near to, the, to making the decision. And he made the decision. What is this thing that tempted him? And he said, I like it. How nice would have it been for me to be in a faraway land? There I would have been free. There I'd do whatever I wanted. There I'd do whatever I like. And here I'd just sit around and suffer in the strictness of the limitations of the house of my father. He thought about it. He worked on it. He, it grew in him. It multiplied in him. It increased and then it broke out. He couldn't take it anymore. So he said, I'll make my decision. He goes to his father and says, give me the portion of the, uh, of the goods that falls to me. The father knows, but he wants his son to be free. He says, my child, do whatever you want. That is what God is telling us today. Do whatever you want. You hear it? My brother, my sister, do you hear this? I hear it. God is telling you, do whatever you want. <coughs> but know this. That there is a door, a small door, where you will enter difficultly. And afterward, the difficult path which you will walk in, with a struggle. But. This is the road that will lead you to the kingdom of heaven. Only through this. If you want. Here's the broad gate. The broad door. Many can find it. There are other. Just a few can find it. But this is easy. You can go through it. Do whatever you want. This is what God is telling us today. Do whatever you want. The, the, the broad, the wide gate will lead you to a broad way. That is what the, and you'll have a great time. That is what the younger son thought about the faraway land. But the end will be perdition. For that reason, my dear brethren, our Lord, with great persistence, says, <coughs> Strive to enter through the narrow gate. It's a struggle. It's a fight. For you to tame your body into bringing it into subjection. It is a, a struggle. For you to offer the sacrifice bound as a holocaust. It is a struggle for you to come to church. It is a race. It is a race for you to study, to pray. It is a race to, decide, to reject what is vile. Because before you there will always be two doors for everything and for every time span of your life. But Christ says strive to enter through the narrow gate. Because in the end. <coughs> many will be those who will want to come in. They'll be ready. They'll be born again. Baptized in water. Baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they'll want to come in. But they won't be able. Because they have chosen the broad gate 
and the easy way. And after the owner of the house stands up and he closes the door, then you begin to stand outside, knock on the door, say, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he will answer to you, I do not know where you're from, Lord God. And there's an answer to this. What are you saying, Lord? We ate before you, and every Sunday we drank the body and blood of Christ. We were in the church. We were not in the world. We were in the church. <clears throat> we ate and drank before you. And you taught us the word of God. And we listened to you. <clears throat> yes, but you did not ask for me to reveal your heart to you, your present and your future. For that reason, go away from me, you workers of iniquity and injustice. In other words, what would you, what would you work and serve in the broad way? You did whatever you wanted. You wore whatever you wanted. You went wherever you wanted. You thought whatever you th liked. You wanted the things that you wanted. You pursued the things that you wanted. And you forgot the fear of God. You forgot the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You forgot the Word of God. Leave you who works iniquity. And there there is no return. If it is shut... It is shut and it cannot open anymore. That is why the Lord says us this, tells us this thing. And he says this to whom? To the pastor of the church. To him that God has blessed. But we thank God because there is medicine in Gilead. There is healing in Gilead. There is the blood of Jesus Christ. There is the power of the Holy Spirit. There is the Word of God. There is also a, a doctor in Gilead. There is Jesus Christ. Who is speaking to all of us without any exception today. There is. He's there. So learn that you have such a good opinion about yourself. And you think that everything is going well with you. Learn that you who believe in this way. You are the wretched and the vile and the poor and the naked. You. For that reason I advise you. To buy tried gold buy for, buy for me gold refined in the fire and what does buy from the word of God means sell the other words sell them if you do not sell the things that you have you cannot buy the gold that is refined in the fire which is the word of God pick up the word of God in your life not only in your hands, put it in your heart. Again, start from the beginning. You cannot make a different beginning except from the Word of God. Pick up the Word of God. Begin from there. The Word of God is the only one that is approved, that is refined in fire. that will never disappoint you, that will never lie to you. But it's not only the Word of God. Buy also white garments that you may be clothed. Sell the garments that you're wearing. Sell the clothes that you're wearing. The, the, the funky, forgive me to say this, the skewed clothes, the new clothes that you're wearing, the different ones. Sell those clothes that you're wearing on your body, soul, and your spirit. And return to the blood of Jesus and to the holy life. 
Return to where you started from. With regeneration, with baptism in the Holy Spirit. Sell all these things that you have. Cast them off of you. Take off the, the clothes of the body, soul, and spirit which are different. Send, take off of you the different things from the Word of God. You know the clothes that you need to be wearing. The white garments which are the rights of the saints. And the only one who can give you these white garments is Jesus Christ. So go to Him. You repent. Throw away, condemn, and ask for Christ to put on the first garment for you. The first and the best. The one that you used to wear. The beautiful, the bright one, the shining one. Because if you don't do this, until now, I give you grace and I hide you, but very soon... The, na the shame of your nakedness will be revealed. You will be disgraced. I won't be the one to disgrace you. God doesn't disgrace anyone. But you'll do it on your own. You'll find yourself at a dead end. This apparel that you're wearing. This Babylonian garment that you're wearing. Will lead you to nakedness. I repeat. The Lord says these things to the pastor of the church and to everyone who has authority. But also to everyone who wants to listen and hear to what the Holy Spirit says to the church. I want to hear this, Lord. I want to hear because I want to make a new beginning in my life. I want to let this small footsteps to the side and follow that the footsteps of Jesus again. Amen, my brethren. And anoint your eyes so you can see with eye solve because now you can't see. You've lost your vision. You've lost the witness of Christ, the presence of Christ. You're not seeing well. You can see vaguely and fakely your heart shows different images of beauty before you. Your heart has changed its vision of holiness, of cleanness, of the kingdom of heaven. And has brought before you a new vision, an earthly vision that is human of the faraway land. And you like it. So for that reason, anoint your eyes with eye salve. Ask for the blood of Jesus Christ to clean you so you can see clearly. Ask for the blood of the Word of God. Ask for the voice of the Holy Spirit so that it may give you holy vision. And now he excuses, if you may permit me to say this expression, his harshness. He justifies his harshness. <coughs> As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. If I sadden you because of my words, does the word that you hear seem heavy? Yes, it is rebuke. It is chastening. It's good that it seems heavy on you. It's very good that you stand and think, I did not come to hear these things today. I came here to hear support and comfort. What the Lord says, I am speaking to you in this way because I love you. Only whomever I love, I rebuke and chasten. Because I want your future to be good. I want your future to be glorious and blessed. Not in the wealth of your imagination, but in the wealth of heaven. For that reason, I now stand at the door of your heart. And I knock in this way of rebuke, of love, of training. And now it depends on you. Whoever hears my voice and opens it, I will come, I'll come in, 
I'll sit with him and we'll change everything. There is a doctor in Gilead. There is medicine. There is blessing in the presence of God. Will you now open the door? Have you heard the voice? I heard the voice, Lord. Will you open the door? Open wide, Lord. Because I want you to come in. I want you to dine with me and I to dine with you. I want us to stand in the same table and to speak as a friend to his friend. I want to see you, Lord, and you to see me. I want to hear you and you to hear me. I want to touch you and you to touch me. I want us to be one. I want you to dwell in my house, in my heart. I almost sent you away, Lord. I almost drove you away. I almost lost my path. But today, I open my heart. I open it, Lord. I open my heart and I receive you. I want to start again from the beginning. I'm not wealthy. I'm small and poor and wretched and vile. I'm insignificant. I'm... I'm useless. <clears throat> I don't want to lose you, Lord. Let me not lose myself. I want to come back into the narrow gate again and walk in the difficult path. I don't want the broad gate nor the easy way. I want this gate that will lead me to heaven where we will walk hand in hand where I will walk in your footsteps where I will enjoy your love where I will see your heavenly kingdom the new Jerusalem the city of our appointed feasts through faith but this is the faith that I want I don't want to see the palaces of this world, the great things of this world, the pleasures of this world. I want to see the new Jerusalem that descends from heaven, there where God will dwell, and He will be my God, and I will dwell there, and I will be His Son. That is what I want to see, Lord. And He concludes. By saying, whoever overcomes, this is a race, a struggle. There's no doubt about it. It is a struggle. It is a struggle, but Paul says, I have fought the good fight. Why? Because there is also the other race. The race of this world. The race of us gaining this world even if we lose our soul. But we want the good race with a good pastor, good shepherd in our heavenly kingdom. He who overcomes to him in the end I will give him to sit with me in my throne as I overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Only he who overcomes. Overcomes what? His own heart that is deceiving him of all things and desperately wicked. He overcomes what? His pleasure, the thing that he likes. And he goes to God and he says, I don't want the thing that I like. I want the thing that you like. He who overcomes his own will. And he goes to Christ and he says, My heart wants, but I want what you want, Lord. And in the end, he overcomes his own decisions. I will do the thing that you want, Lord, the thing that you like, Lord, and the thing that you have planned and prepared in your good counsel for me and the path that you have prepared for me. My God, teach me the way that I have to walk in. My God, teach me to do your will. My God, forgive me. Amen.